Welcome to part two of our conversation with David Pierce Rodriguez about growing out of possession. Would you say, was there any sort of intervention that that occurred in your case that that helped relieve you of the possession as one would think of, you know, exorcisms and things of that nature? Or was it was it really simply just the move that lifted this away from you? It was the move. It was a change of school. It was, um, you know, I was going to a new high school. I had been going to a, a, a male only high school before. And then I get to go to a one with women and men. I'm finally 16. You know, I moved with my dad. It was a great time. My whole just my whole mind shifted. And I don't think that I mean, that's probably the most important thing in a possession case is changing the the mindset of the person the, of the host, you know, mm-hmm. the one who has the possession because like a fish who lives in salt water can't live in the can't live in the fresh water it's the same thing you change the alkalinity and you change the vibe and and they don't want to live with you anymore Mm -hmm. and also that the location um, you know i think that thing was tied more to ohio and that stuff i mean even just with paranormal cases in general some of the stuff will stick with you i don't think the ghost necessarily comes on with you unless you have an object or something but you can bring kind of like some, you know, mojo from a case. I've I've had it multiple times, and I think the thing from going through a possession like that, you def- that stuff sticks with you for a while. But um, yeah, it just it it couldn't live with me once I moved. I just was a different person altogether. Mm-hmm. It, and, a- but but if I would have lived in Columbus and not left, I would have had to have some kind of intervention. I was going to yeah. church at the time. I probably would have done something. Ask them about it. I mean, it was Methodist, so I don't know if they would have helped, but it just, um, you know, I did ask a lot of questions at church back then, but mm-hmm. wasn't really getting the answers that I wanted. But, yeah. You know. When you look back at at that house and, and the darkness that seemed to surround it, as an adult, all these years later, and I know you say you're, you're still drawn to it, but you can't go in there. Someone else is living there. What have you found? What did you, when you look back, do you have any idea, any research, any information on what was causing such darkness uh, on that property? Such a, a oppressive type force that that obviously affected you greatly, but also did affect the others who resided there as well. Yeah, there was like a lot of even there was deaths on our family there. There was a lot of a lot of strange deaths in that house too, like people falling downstairs and things like that dying that way and it just the house is real it's a it's a creepy place in a way it's awesome beautiful house but it's like it's got that at nighttime that place shifts um like i said it's got little like mazes like trap doors and, mm-hmm. and it's got a, like a dumb waiter that goes from the you know top floor to the bottom floor really strange things um where like a kid can hide out and go down the dumb waiter um Sorry, Tony, I totally, <laughs> totally forgot what you're asking now, me. So my, my question is, what's behind the darkness of that house? Do you have any idea yeah, why, I think it, it, ha- why it, would it would be have so to do, It would have to do with, um, I think it's the land, the property, and probably my grandfather helped build that house. It was built out of limestone rock from a quarry. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that had something to do with it. The, I think the, the running, the creek that would go around the back of the house had a lot to do with it. Um, the land that it was by a Native American burial ground had something to do with it. Um, just, I'm probably the limestone had the the, the main thing to do with it. I, maybe the sh- also I've I've noticed like if you have weird shaped houses with strange corridors and stuff, those houses tend to get can I say more haunted maybe than other houses do. Like I mean, look sure. at the Winchester house and stuff like that. Just. I don't know why. Maybe that traps a <laughs> traps a ghost into a if they're going around a weird angle or something. I don't know, but that house is it, it just was haunted. I mean, you could have. I mean, anything could be haunted, but that mm-hmm. house was just. It was. It's the property. So you look more so Point back right. on on like the geographics and the architecture and all of that as kind of being almost a perfect storm for attracting negative energy into it, not necessarily a single traumatic event or a series of traumatic events that had occurred on the the property or something like that, that you were unaware of. Yeah. Maybe it does hold, it holds all those deaths and it held the rape of that girl and mm-hmm. it holds, you know, that property is just, it, you know, keeps it like a memory. 
it just kind of keeps going and going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can go to the Energizer Bunny <laughs> uh, line there. Tell me, uh, tell me more about now. As you did got, get older, obviously, um, you know, you, you had moved on um, in, into your teen years and 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 later finding interest still in the paranormal, but but not really being able to pursue it in your 20s. What were some of the small things that were happening that slowly kind of drew you back into that world of, hey, I'm going to take a second shot at investigating the paranormal, and hopefully this time I won't get possessed? Well, it started happening when I started working as a restaurant manager, um, well, you know, in college, you know, bartending, waiting tables, and then it took on to, went up to, um, managing restaurants and there was a restaurant called Il Radicchio in Arlington, Virginia and I was a manager there. It's still there. A little Italian restaurant, two level place and the place is just absolutely super haunted. I went there um, earlier this year and talked to the manager too and was asking him about the stories and like, oh yeah, we heard about you with the ghost and all this. But uh, when I'd manage there at night, the strangest thing would happen. Like there, uh, there was a girl that worked there that every time she was working, we had one of those big um, like CD players that had like it would spin like 20 discs, you know. It was like the biggest one you could get and would shuffle up all the time. So we usually put Italian music in there and some other stuff. And then so everyone would leave. The music's still playing. And as she's about ready to clean up and everything, pretty much every time she was working, it would go to this one song. And I'm like – I started noticing after four or five times, I'm like – her name was Terrier. And I said, Terrier – why is it is what is this song and why is it when you're working that the song comes out she goes oh it's my favorite song and i go does this always happen she goes yeah it's been happening since i started working here and i go don't you think that's like crazy or what and she's like oh yeah this place is super haunted she goes i won't even go upstairs to get like you know where the office was she goes i won't go up there to get anything you sometimes you had to get plates and things up there and they'd make the pizza dough upstairs and uh she goes i won't go up there at night she goes it's super haunted and whatever it is i think it's a man and he's like he's like attracted to me and you know and that's why he's playing the music but so that story would happen and then uh one night i'm there by myself Right next to the office is um, a bathroom. So I'm, I have to do the paperwork at night, count the money. I have the downstairs absolutely locked, and downstairs was just the, the chef cleaning up there. But I have to lock the door because, you know, I'm counting thousands of dollars, and it's D.C., and, you know, anybody can come rob you. So um, uh, I have all my paperwork set up, money on the desk. I go to pee really quick. I go, like, right there, and I hear I hear the trash can. I mean, I can tell what the sound was. It was – the trash can went across the floor and then up to my chair and it was the trash can that was up in the corner and I would kind of like, you know, crumple the paper up and basketball it over, you know, to try to make that. That's how that was the thing we would do. All the managers just throw it in there. So you just see crumpled paper, you know, balls all around the floor where people would miss. And I hear Shh, that thing go across the floor. I'm like, what? I run out and it's right up against the chair. And I go, this is crazy. I said, I have to start filming this or this is you know people need to see this this is like that's that's crazy you know what mm-hmm. i mean a trash can just moved across the floor um so and then i started that that got me interested into it it wasn't too much later well i had to move from dc um i was married at the time to somebody who was in the military so in the navy so we got um sent up to omaha nebraska and then once we got to omaha nebraska things were slower there not too much to do so i started my team I mean, I tried to join a team first. There was only a team there that was a couple, um, like a, a man and a woman, and they didn't want anybody to join them. So I uh, started like a meetup.com thing, and people came, and we ended up starting a team, and that was that. I see. When you began investigating the paranormal with, with this new team that you had created initially, what was going through your mind is is what were you trying to accomplish? Obviously, everybody, you know, interest in getting evidence and things of that nature. But overall, was it just to collect evidence and, and you know, prove that it exists to one another? Yeah, I think with it was like curiosity? proving. OK. Yeah, it was proving, you know, I was still still, I guess, taking on that the weight of when I was a kid. And I wanted to, you know, prove that trash can going across the floor, prove mm-hmm. that this stuff existed. And, you know, I mean. I'd never been in a paranormal team and never even, you know, it, it was, it was nice to have that camaraderie. Everyone had the same kind of goal. Everyone had cameras and everyone was buying EMF detectors and, 
you know, cassette recorders or whatever the heck we were using 20 years ago. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and it, it's, you know, now when people say, why do you investigate? I guess every case is different, you know, I mean, some cases, you know, but back then it was just to kind of, I was just happy to go to a cemetery to tell you the truth. I didn't know sure. that it would end up the Velisca Axe murder house and craziness like that. Did you, uh, or should I ask, how how soon into investigating with your, your team at the time, that new team that you had formed, did you get your proof that you were seeking? It was really, really fast. With with Within the first year, I think by Christmas of 2014, we were already on TV, like with the local news. So we, and I learned really early on that if I wanted to get in somewhere, like, having the news come with you is a really good way to get in somewhere. So I kind of, I, I, um, went out looking for, to kind of, I don't know, prove, disprove or find the places that were on, you know, any back then, what was it where there was like a list of haunted places, but that's where everyone would work off, off the internet. There's like sure. this one list and I would go there and see anything that was around my area. And I'd be like, Oh, that's good. That's not. Then I started to kind of prospect other places, but, um, we did like the squirrel cage jail. We're the first people to go in there and l- literally within the first year, got an apparition photo of the thing. We got great EVPs. Um, I don't know, just, the, I had a really good team that we had really good results and, I, you know, sometimes you have just the right people and, and the right time. I mean, everything that that first year or two of of Prism in Nebraska just was amazing. We went so many places and got so much stuff. I mean, we were in by the in the first year we were at the Bliska Axe Murder House, one of the first people there. We mm-hmm. um, I even went there with Troy Taylor, Ursula Bielski. Um, and I was telling Troy, I said, this, the door opens and closes. It's on its own there. He goes, no, 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 no. I said, no, it does. And then, uh, Ursula was upstairs, saw it happen to her and she's like, oh my God. So he runs up there and sees it for himself. I'm like, this place is truly, truly, truly haunted. Um, I mean, just even just that, my wife was, who was, uh, who's a commander in the Navy, my ex-wife. She didn't really believe in all this kind of stuff. She <laughs> thought it was fun that I was doing it. It was a good hobby for me or whatnot. But uh, she, when she saw the door open and close in Velisca on its own, um, that it, she she believed after that. So I mean, that pla- that house made a lot of people believers. Um, and it was nice to be able to take the news there and go to some place that was really haunted. So you're out actually getting good evidence, you know. Sure. Did you have any any reservations or fear about getting involved in the paranormal world? Uh, you know, on a, a level of of investigating again. As a child, you were you know doing your version of investigating as a kid at, at your your childhood home, but then you're setting out again here as an adult to to subject yourself to the paranormal and and obviously first round it didn't work out the greatest with the possession to put it lightly right Uh, were were you concerned at all of just having firsthand having had that experience was there any caution uh, you know in you about going back into that that atmosphere of could this happen again well, I didn't really think that until I mean, because ghosts to me are a whole different ball game than like what what was going on there. It didn't hit me until we had a possession case in in Omaha mm-hmm. in this one apartment, and and then I kind of I started to see the. I mean, there was even there's even a time where the woman who's possessed came up to me, puts me up against the wall. Her eyes are all black underneath. She totally would change. Put me up against the wall, and she's like, "You're gonna go to hell. I've met you already." Like this thing, like, and I'm thinking, and then it hits me in my head: this is the same person that was like, "Is this the same like demon or whatnot that doesn't know like me, like my story?" Because I yeah. didn't tell anybody that back then. You know, doesn't know what I went through. Is it the same? You know, and then you start thinking, "Oh, sh- crap! This is cyclical. You know, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. This could affect me." And actually, that case I think led to my divorce. It was one of the things that did. I mean, obviously, I was part of that. My ex-wife was part of that. But it was one of the things that really led to to my divorce, taking on that case. It's just um, so now, you know, if there's a possession case or something, I I don't think tw- I don't know. I feel like I feel like I have something to give to these people, so mm-hmm. I don't really think twice about it. But yeah. I understand that how they can get. You know how they, how dangerous they can get. I mean, in that case alone, there was um, people on our team were passing out. They were having yeah. fits on the floor. You know, um, 
we had nurse on, we had a couple of nurses on our team back then and it's just it, those they get dangerous those cases sure and take i want i want to hear about that case it was going to be my next question is what led you to get involved with the possession case how did that come to you and if you would you know kind of walk us through what went what went down there well, that was that was back in the day when I kind of leave my card out with a phone number at uh, like New Age shops and whatnot. There was nothing paranormal. Nobody would do anything about that back back in the day in Nebraska. So um, I put that out there and hope somebody would call. And these were the type of people that like it's a nightmare. The type of people that will call you at two in the morning type of thing. <laughs> sure, yeah. But and I'm like, oh my god, I'll never do that again. Put my phone number out. But the um, it, it ended up just a really interesting case i mean i'm glad i you know i experienced it with them but it um it was basically these people this couple they were in their uh early 40s i'd say they um they had moved into this apartment that come to find out later that a couple weeks before they moved in or a week before they moved in there was a a, some kind of crack deal gone bad and Mm -hmm. the guy got shot in the apartment right Mm-hmm. So there was a, a murder in that apartment literally like right before they moved in. Um, I'm sure that didn't help anything. <laughs> and they came in and basically um, they called me saying, ever since we moved to this apartment, um, it's affecting our job. It's affecting sleep that she's waking up with scratches and and all this. So I went over there and immediately when I went to that house, like on a, doing a pre-investigation – I, d- I did get the, like that same sense of like when I was a kid, like there's certain things with with the possession, at least I believe with the possession that it, it tends to like, I guess originally it's maybe in the house and then it affects the person, but then it affects the house even more. Like in this house, there was even like uh, it's an like an oil coming out of the out of, out of some of the walls like there was it was alive that house in, in a sense that um well i don't even know how to explain it but it, it definitely had the like you would walk in and go oh something's going on here you know even if you didn't believe it um it was a, th- a thick atmosphere in that house yeah. and it would change when she would um there's i have a video on youtube about it. if anybody wants to see it just ha- have to look up omaha nebraska possession prism or something like that it, you'll find it it's a really old video but mm-hmm. um she I, I took one video of her where she was you know going into the change and at this time basically what would happen is we'd have her sitting in a chair you she would just kind of start rocking we'd all just be talking and then the minute she'd start getting quiet and then like then her eye like she would just kind of have like these neck like kind of like moving her neck around and then like and then her eyes would kind of look all wacky and then and then her voice would change and she, we'd see the shift you know and I'm have even at this time we have I have a nurse there taking her blood pressure at the same time I just wanted to find out as much as we could and it's interesting to, to the nurse it was interesting to see what would happen in a case like this but what would happen is I would put um God, what were we using back in the day? Because we didn't have REM pods. It was uh, those cell sensors, okay, um, which are now like ghost meter or whatever. But the mm-hmm. cell sensor with the cable, I would have a cell sensor in every room, and in her bedroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, in the bathroom. What happened is when she would start turning and going, going ah, and doing all these weird voices and stuff. And then fighting with her husband, her husband would start being like, in the name of Jesus, you know, whatever, because that's what how he felt like he needed to deal with it. Um, you know, we're casting you out and stuff, the husband would say. Probably he's been watching too much TV. But I guess that was for the church more to do than him. But um, he's afraid, so I get that. But what would happen in the house is the the meters would the, – it would go off in the bedroom first. You'd hear beep, 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 beep. And then she'd do like a little laugh and then you'd then you'd hear beep, 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 beep. It'd get higher. And then the kitchen would start going beep, beep, beep. Basically, by the time she was like all full on possession, mm-hmm. there's like six six meters going off throughout the whole house. The whole house is charged, you know? It's <laughs> crazy stuff. And you could feel it was going on, you know? Um and then and then stuff would happen. Like it would take on like usually the weakest person. They would feel something. Like they'd have to get out of the house get out of that house because it was just they would either get too much of a headache want to throw up or you know some person went into spasms uh it was just it was just crazy stuff 
and we ended up working with the church. The church, uh, the church really, it was hard to get help with the church. Um, got a bunch of evidence, videotaped it, and actually went to different churches looking for help. And one did help us. They said they were going to do a uh, high mass and, or a, on the, and pray on it. And, you know, they'd get back to me if anything, whatever. And basically the next day they got back to us saying that they would help, that they prayed on it. And, yes, the family needed help. So, um, you know, that was fortunate. But they came, to, you know, two weeks later, this whatever it was was back. Um, they came a second time. It came back. These people had to move. She moved to a different state, and things got a little bit better. But it, things, you know, kind of fo- followed her around a little bit. But the vibe of it all did. But um, it got better when she moved. That apartment was just really bad. Yeah, I mean, when, when you when you went into that, and and you, to hear that that she had uh, eventually, it, it seemed to have resolved it for itself. Were you concerned that with the familiarity of the feelings that maybe this was something similar? Maybe this was the same sort of thing that had possessed you as a child and it was back. Um, are, are you ever fearful of when you kind of get into the, some of those similar circumstances or feelings that maybe something is not that far away from you or that distant and that it, it could make a return? Is there anything that, that you do today to protect yourself from that? Well, I guess the first part of the thing there was that, like, when I was there, like, when she was talking to me, I could feel that it knew about the stuff that I had gone through, but just by the stuff she was saying that she had said to me mm-hmm. during days there. But it was not the same creature, being, demon, whatnot. It was just, I think they have, I, I mean, do they talk to each other? Do what, what goes on? But, like, they know. They know from case to case they can carry on stuff like a memory, and I don't know what that's all about. But that's for I'm not a demonologist, but I'm sure they would understand. But uh, the um, uh, the second part of the question there is what were you asking me? The second part is <laughs> if uh, oh if 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 now if that's well. Is do I like have an attachment from this stuff? Probably would be the question, right? That or, or, or do or, I believe or, or, that? I do. Or are you afraid of, of of getting one more so? Well, I think that some of like the energy of what I went through stuck with me. I don't think that that being is with me anymore. I do believe that you can have attachments. I do believe in guardian angels and things like that as well. I mean, mm-hmm. I've had stories with that happen as well. But I think things are following. I think we have things following us all the time. Every human being does. I mean, that's just my belief. But sure. hopefully good stuff and not bad stuff. But um, I think when when this stuff, like like I say, if it depends on the case. If I'm on a case that's really dark, um, then I can kind of feel – maybe that's – I kind of feel that there was – I don't know how to explain it. But uh, God, like that, how do you explain Boy, I'm a loss for words right now. But like that case, the possession case, mm-hmm. I can I, I can see remnants. I feel remnants of what was going on in me. But I think it's just more like a place memory from before saying I've been here before type of thing. I don't like that stuff hasn't doesn't show itself anymore because I just don't think it's around me. But that wraps up the second part of our conversation with David Pierce Rodriguez. A big thanks to him for joining us on today's program and sharing his very personal experiences with all of us. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.